Hello everyone, um, this is Alex and today I'm here to talk about a topic called equilibrium and um, this involves uh, something called a reversible reaction. So let's take a look at the sorts of reactions um, that you're familiar with up till now. So the sorts of reactions that you're familiar with up till now go all the way. So what do I mean by that? Take for example the combustion of carbon in oxygen. So I'm going to take some carbon powder and just burn it completely in oxygen and all of it will convert to carbon dioxide gas, well theoretically anyway. <clears throat> and this carbon dioxide now has no tendency whatsoever to break up to form oxygen or carbon. It's just you know it's just released into the air, and um, it's you know it's it's gone. So I've drawn uh, a a arrow in one direction, and this sort of reaction we call a non-reversible reaction. So this means that the the reaction can't go the other way from which it came. Well, there happens to be another class of reactions where you can actually have the products either decompose or react in some way to form the reactants again. So an example of this is if I were to react some nitrogen, some hydrogen gas, that's going to give me ammonia gas. So let's just balance that. And in this particular reaction, the ammonia can decompose to form the nitrogen and hydrogen. So I'm going to draw an arrow in both directions, a double arrow, to indicate the fact that this reaction can proceed in both directions and this we usually call a reversible reaction right so it's it's entirely possible for these to um, break up and form the reactants so you can imagine um, once I start the reaction say I put in nitrogen and hydrogen and they start reacting 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 and they start forming more and more ammonia at some point and while I beg your pardon, and and while the ammonia is forming, some of it can break up to form hydrogen and nitrogen. So let's just draw a graph to represent that to see what's happening. So what I have here is um, time on this axis, and these are the concentrations um, of my species, which, whichever species I am interested in. So let's have another graph here as well. So this will be my concentrations of nitrogen and hydrogen, or, or hydrogen, let's say. And on this side, I will have concentration of ammonia. Okay, so as time goes on, let's just take, well, this might confuse you, so let's, let's just take the pink to be nitrogen. And bear in mind that while nitrogen is used up, hydrogen is used up three times as quickly. So um, I'll just use nitrogen as a representative for the reactants. So as the reaction proceeds, my nitrogen is being used up while at the same time my ammonia which I will represent in gold here so it is my ammonia uh, at the same time ammonia start increasing but um, you know while, while, while it's increasing it's not increasing as quickly as it would if none of it were to break up so it's uh, you know if, if it were to break up it will increase much more quickly but then in this case it's increasing more slowly and then at some point they reach something we call an equilibrium wherein the um, 
the concentrations don't change anymore. So I guess I should have drawn this, I beg your pardon, I should have drawn this axis in gold. Okay, anyway, that axis is in gold and it just shows you the concentration of ammonia. So if I start it with 100% uh, nitrogen, not all of my nitrogen will be converted to ammonia because the, while, it's, while this thing is going on, while, while the nitrogen is decreasing, the ammonia is also coming back and furnishing more nitrogen. So at some point, say I get to about 40% um, nitrogen, and then what I'll get is um, say 60% by mass of ammonia, right? So we we say that my reaction yield is 60%. That's the best I can do given the conditions of pressure, temperature, and um, concentrations. This is all you know. This is all the ammonia that that I can get because the reaction um, has, uh, for all intents and purposes, stopped. Well, I, I need to be careful when I say stop because the reaction is still going on. You still have um, these guys reacting to form ammonia and ammonia breaking up to form nitrogen and hydrogen. But they're happening at the same rate. So by the time they get to here, both the forwards and reverse reactions are happening at the same rate. So let me just write that down. Forward and reverse reactions. happen at the same rate such that whenever a mole whenever two molecules of ammonia break up to form a molecule of nitrogen and three molecules of hydrogen at that same time t one molecule of nitrogen is reacting with three molecules of hydrogen to give me two molecules of ammonia so because they're happening at the same rate to the observer it looks like as if the concentrations are not actually changing right so at that point we say that the reaction has reached dynamic equilibrium so let me just write that real big dynamic equilibrium dynamic meaning that um, the reaction is still happening I still have you know the nitrogens and hydrogens reacting from ammonia and ammonia breaking up from nitrogens and hydrogens but at the same time it's in an equilibrium because to the outside observer it looks like as if the react the concentrations are no longer changing they're just the um, same concentrations right so very frequently you have um, reactions like this in industry and you try to maximize the so-called yield so say this is an uh, a production of ammonia and you have a factory producing ammonia and you try to change the conditions such that you get squeeze as much ammonia out as possible um, you know given the constraints of the costs of operating your factory so we'll take a look at how we can do that but before we can do that we need to investigate individually what each um, condition has to do uh, how each condition actually affects the equilibrium of the system, the so-called equilibrium, right? So I'm going to say things like when you push the equilibrium to the right, meaning that you get a high yield of products, and when I say push equilibrium to the left, it means you get less products but more reactants. Just think of it as a scale balance. Um, you know, if, if if you like, you can you can think of it as a scale balance where um, if I would have you know more reactants than products then my scale would tip in the direction of the uh, product so I, I could have you know 60% here and 40% here and, and it would tip in that direction so if it tips in the direction of the products I would have more product but before we get to investigating how external conditions can affect the equilibrium of the system, how it can tip the scale in favor of either the products or reactants. I need to introduce to you something called Le Chatelier's principle. Um, 
So this was discovered by a Frenchman in the 19th century. His name was Le Chatelier. And if you look at the Wikipedia definition, this is what it says. So any change in status quo prompts an opposing reaction in the responding system. So this you can ex do this as experiments in the lab, and, and you'll see that this indeed is true. And in fact, it has a larger uh, implication than just chemistry. You know, it has implications in uh, sociology and economics, um, where this notion of what we call a negative feedback, which is that if you try to stress the system in one direction, it tries to do something to somewhat somehow relieve that stress right? so um, that's that's kind of like a vague and big you know uh, amorphous definition of it so let's take uh, a look at how this actually works in terms of uh, a chemical reaction so let's say I have um, a reaction where I have two reactants and now I'm gonna draw the reversible reaction arrow Notice I'm drawing it a bit differently than how I drew it before. This is really how you're supposed to draw it. And A and B will react to form C and D, while at the same time C and D can, you know, bounce into each other and react and form A and B. So I want to look at the effect of changing the temperature, right? So we're going to just change one perimeter at a time and say this reaction is endothermic. Now, if you recall from the uh, video on energetics. What endothermic means is that the reaction will take in heat. So what I will do to represent that is I will add heat as a reactant because then what this will show me is that A and B will react with the addition of heat to form C and D. So it's removing heat um, from the environment. It's absorbing heat from the environment to form C and D. Okay, so let's say we have this reversible reaction and it happens to be endothermic in the forward direction, right, which means that it will be exothermic in the reverse direction because if I look at it in this direction, it looks like C and D is reacting to release heat as a product. So, um, so okay. So it's going to take in heat and uh, form C and D. So let's say I increase the temperature of the medium in which this reaction is taking place. Right? What does that mean? That means I'm supplying heat to the system. So if I increase the temperature, I supply heat. To the system. Okay, and when I supply heat to the system, according to Le Chatelier's principle, the system is going to want to uh, relieve that heat. So, how can it do that? It can do that by taking the heat away. And it does that by absorbing it into itself, thus decreasing the temperature of the environment. So, according to the Chatelier's principle, the system will remove that heat, thus lowering the temperature of the environment. Okay. So how can it remove that heat? It can remove that heat by moving in the forwards direction. So, uh, so we say that the equilibrium has been pushed to the right because by moving to the right, it's taking away this heat um, and forming them into C and D, which which has less heat than uh, what we started out with. Right now. That may seem a bit, you know, so, so what's, what's the chemistry that's going on here? What's really going on here? Well, unfortunately, you're going to have to wait until um, you study a bit more thermodynamics 
um, later on to actually try to verify Le Chatelier's principle. But for now, um, just rest assured that if you were to do an experiment that involves an endothermic reaction, um, you will what you will observe is that indeed increasing um, the heat of the solution, maybe just heating it using a Bunsen burner, will result in more products and less reactants. So I'll shift it to the right and maybe to start with at 60% of A and B and 40% of C and D at dynamic equilibrium. If I heat it, I will now have at a new dynamic equilibrium um, less A and B and more C and D. So if you like, uh, we can draw draw that graph again just to show you. So I had so I have something like this to begin with. So I had 60% of products and 40%, sorry, 60% of reactants, right? I start with 100% reactants, go down to 60%, and I start with 0% products, go up to 40% products, and it's reached that dynamic equilibrium. And then say at this point, I stress the system. So at this point, I increase the temperature. And now, Suddenly, the equilibrium will start shifting again, and I will now have my reactants um, become less, and products become more. You know, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to switch to 60-40. You know, it, it could get pushed higher, and this one lower, if you like, uh, depending on what the temperature is, but. Um, it, it will it will disturb the system, and the system will try to move in such a direction as to uh, minimize that change or, or to to counter it altogether. So, this this principle is very useful, and and it you know allows us at least um, on on a high level to to sort of deduce what will happen um, when I change the uh, the external conditions. So the overall crux of this is that uh, increasing the temperature will you know favor uh, an, an endothermic reaction so increasing temperature favors an endothermic reaction right there, there are many ways of saying it this is just one way of saying it and again you know this this is something you just have to accept for now the Chatelet's principle until we uh, talk um, more about thermodynamics at which point um, you can actually uh, confirm the, the theory. So <clears throat> likewise we can look at what happens if I uh, now decrease the temperature. So if I decrease the temperature for this system um, it's going to want to oppose that change and it can d do that by trying to increase the temperature of the system. So it wants to release more heat. So that means that it's going to go backwards to release heat. So if I were to decrease the temperature of the system, I would actually decrease the yield. So decrease in temperature would decrease the amount of C and D, giving me um, more A and B and with heat released at the same time um, because that will bring the temperature back up to oppose the decrease in temperature that I started out with. Next, let's take a look at how a changing pressure might affect the equilibrium of the system. So let's say I have um, a system where, so we're looking at pressure changes here. And take note that this only applies to gases because you can't squeeze solids or liquids the particles in a solid or liquid any closer together so um, pressure won't have any effect on reactions involving solids or liquids but if there happens to be one or more gases in um, your reaction then that would affect the equilibrium so say for example I have um, on the left side two gases of A and a gas of B reacting to form let's say a gas of C right so let's take a look at what's going on here so 
I have my container which um, you know I represent an orange and then I have two molecules of A A one time and a molecule of B that I represent in purple and the molecule of C in pink. So I end up with um, these two molecules of A reacting with this one molecule of B um, giving me that one molecule of C on the right side. Right. So if I increase the pressure of the system, let's see what Le Chatelier's principle tells us uh, will happen to the system. So if I were to increase um, the pressure of the system either by changing the volume or you know, by forcing more atmospheres onto the container, etc. So let's see what will happen. Okay. So what's uh, what I'm going to have here is I have three particles here, and they are all colliding against the walls. Now it's important to note that these two uh, are at the same temperature. Okay. I'm not changing the temperature uh, at any time during this experiment. So they're all at the same temperatures, which means that the particles are all moving at the same speed. If you recall, temperature is a measure of how fast the particles are moving. So they are all moving at the same speeds. So you would expect that if you have more particles with the same speed colliding against the walls, you would have a greater force on the walls. And since pressure is force divided by area, you result in a higher pressure in the container with more particles. So I'm going to write P1, P2, and P1 is greater than P2. Okay, so if I were to increase the pressure of this system, the Chatelier's principle will tell me that the system wants to relieve that pressure. So if I increase the pressure, system wants to relieve that pressure. Now obviously the system can't reach out and you know it's got no hands to reach out to change the pressure gauge on my um, experiment etc. So the only way you can do that is to move to the side uh, that will result in less pressure and that side happens to be the side with less particles in it which is the right side. So system moves to side with less particles. In this case, that side happens to be the right side or the product side. So what I have is a situation where the yield of products increases because there are less product molecules. Right, so you could make the same argument for um, any situation involving gases. It will always move to the side uh, with less particles and if I were to decrease the pressure then the opposite situation will happen. So if you decrease the pressure, the system wants to bring it back to the higher pressure, meaning the pressure that was there before, and hence it will shift to side with more particles because that side will yield a higher pressure. Okay, So that was a look at what pressure will do to the equilibrium. Let's take a look at what a catalyst might do to the equilibrium. So Factor number three, catalyst. So if you recall from the uh, video on rates of reaction, what does a catalyst do to a reaction? So say I have a reaction where I'm turning A and B into C and D. So the energy that it has to overcome to break the bonds um, in order to form the products is called the activation energy shown here by EA right so it has to 
overcome this hill before it can roll over onto the product side. So what a catalyst does is it lowers the activation energy. So it provides an alternative pathway such that the activation energy is lowered. So the activation energy is lowered by the catalyst by how much? By this much. So lowered by this much. Now, obviously, the amount that it's lowered um, by to go from the left to the right is the same as the amount it's lowered by to go from the right to the left, right? So whichever side you look at it from, um, it's been lowered by the same amount. So because of that, you would expect that the reaction rates in both directions uh, will be increased by the same amount. So reaction rates in both directions increased by same amount. Now because of that, um, the rate of formation of reactants and rate of formation of products are the same. Therefore, you would expect no change in the shift of the equilibrium of the system, right? So no change in equilibrium, equilibrium, because they are moving um, in each direction more quickly. Um, so if you look at the uh, graph of formation versus time, if previously you had your products forming at this rate, and your reactants decreasing, coming down to here, and reaching dynamic equilibrium right there. In the presence of the catalyst, you might see that they form more quickly. So the reactants will decrease to that point, and what you see is that they reach dynamic equilibrium more quickly, but the amounts, the final amounts formed, don't change, right? So if I had 40% reactants to begin with, before the cat adding the catalyst, and then 60% products, it's still 60-40 um, at the end, uh, I mean after adding the catalyst, right? So adding the catalyst has no effect whatsoever on the equilibrium, however, it does change the rate of the reaction. So it does change how fast it reaches dynamic equilibrium. So that might be a factor in industrial production where time is money and, and you want to uh, get your products as quickly as possible. So just bear in mind that it does not change the equilibrium. So the next effect uh, I want to look at is the effect of changing concentrations on the equilibrium. So let's take a look at that. That will be effect number four, concentration. So let's just go back to my generic A plus B giving me C plus D formula. And for concentrations, it's really quite straightforward if you just look at uh, what the Chatelier is principle has to say. Um, say I were to increase uh, A or B, the system will want to move to oppose that increase in A and B, because that's what Le Chatelet's principle says, right? It wants to oppose the any changes to the status quo. The status quo was certain concentration of A and B. If I add more A and B into the system, uh, wants to bring it back down to the previous concentrations, so it moves to um, bring A and B back down. It might not succeed in bringing it completely back down to the initial conditions, but it's going to try. And how can it do that? Well, um, there's only one way it can do that. 
it can only do that by forming the products, right? By moving to the right. And in forming the products, it will remove, um, it will try to remove whatever excess A and B that I put in and form the products, uh, thus um, trying to restore it back to uh, where it was before. All right, so, <clears throat> so that's concentration. And that brings us to the end of uh, this introduction on how to apply Le Chatelier's principle to finding out how the equilibrium will shift um, based on the uh, things that we do to the system, in particular concentration, catalyst pressure, or temperature. In the next video, we'll look at how we can apply this to an industrial process known as the Haber process uh, for the production of ammonia, which is a very important process in making fertilizers.